This podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today. Hello and welcome to Give and Tote Cannabis Conversations, the show that aims to elevate the conversation about cannabis to a higher level. I'm your host, Paul, and today I'm so excited to welcome an absolute powerhouse of a former member of parliament, Fiona Patton. Fiona Patton is the leader of Reason Australia. Originally formed as the Sex Party in 2010, Ms Patton was elected in 2014 to the Victorian Legislative Council, where she tirelessly championed many important and progressive causes until her recent nail-biting election defeat at the end of 2022. Fiona Patton has been a fashion designer, an advocate for sufferers of HIV and AIDS, working in harm reduction programs and needle exchanges, championing decriminalisation for sex workers, and has been essential to achieving many recent social reforms in Victoria. Post politics, she has been nominated to the board of the Australian Medicinal Cannabis Association, a not for profit organisation with a vision for Australia to lead the world in quality, affordable, and accessible medical cannabis. As a member of parliament, Ms. Patton chaired the public inquiry into personal cannabis use and has battled uphill to help other parliamentarians understand how and why people use cannabis. It is rare for anyone in politics to understand their constituents the way Fiona Patton does, and that is why it is my absolute pleasure to welcome her to the show. If you like what you hear, make sure you follow us and review us on your podcast platform of choice and follow us on Instagram at Give and Talk. But for now, please enjoy my conversation with Fiona Patton. I just want to let the listeners know how we first almost met but didn't actually meet. Um, Paul was working overseas and sent me this incredible box that showed the professionalism and the maturity of the cannabis industry overseas. And it was one of the best ways to encapsulate where the industry was by just sending all of these like great packaging, great little promo goods and things like that. And unfortunately, I lost the letter that was attached to the box. So I was never able to contact Paul to thank him until we ran into into each other in an industry event um, late last year. So again, Paul, thank you so much for that. I actually gave away a lot of that and I used it to to good purpose. But I'm very grateful that you were thoughtful enough to do that. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm glad we ran into each other to kind of clarify that because after some time had passed, I was really worried that the package that I'd sent actually looked really dodgy. I'm like sending this kind of nondescript brown paper package to a politician from a different (laughs) country wouldn't always be received super well. So I thought, you know what, if the bomb squad got it, that's on me. (laughs) To be honest, all the staff looked hopefully into all of those empty boxes, (laughs) hoping that at the bottom of those boxes, they may have found something. (laughs) One day, one day. Well, I know you're not one to rest on your laurels. And despite the election defeat late last year, which, you know, was devastating for supporters of yours, I know that hasn't really changed your mission and your vision. You know, politics was a vehicle for you to champion so many things you care about. How have you been spending your time post-politics? Well, I know many, many of your listeners may, if if they know me, they know that I've been going through, I got kidney cancer during the election campaign and had my kidney removed. And I'm going through some preventative um, chemo at the moment. So that's, that's keeping me busy while I think about what I want to do next. However, yeah, as you mentioned, I've joined the um, Australian Medicinal Cannabis Association, or, or hopefully they'll accept my nomination this week. But I've also been talking to the legalised cannabis MPs and just helping them settle in, introducing some of the legislation that I saw as unfinished business. And I was an advocate before I went into Parliament. That will never change. And so I'm starting to look at other ways that I can contribute to not only this debate, but also broader debates on drug law reform and broader debates actually on our criminal justice system at a whole range of other areas, whether that's women's health. So I certainly have not become bored since I left Parliament. Well, that kind of broader talk about criminal justice and decriminalisation, we'll tap into kind of down the track in this episode. Mm. But I guess the best launching point is to really first talk about this legalised cannabis Victoria bill that's coming up in Parliament. I know that in May 2022, there was a petition tabled in Parliament for a review into roadside drug testing. We now have two members of the LCV in Parliament And they have presented this bill to exempt medical patients from roadside drug testing laws. 
Why is this change so important? It's absolutely crucial. We know the benefits of medicinal cannabis. We know that medicinal cannabis often gives people their lives back. But then we cruelly pull that away from people, and I think particularly people in regional areas, by then denying them the right to drive. So people have started feeling a lot better. They're able to kind of want, able and want to take part in daily life, whether that's work, family, volunteering, whatever. But then we deny them the right to drive. <laughs> and it's incredibly discriminatory because no other patient on a legal prescribed medication is denied the right to drive. Certainly, we don't want anyone driving while they are impaired. And we know that there are hundreds of drugs out there that people take every day um, that are possibly impairing. But we manage that risk. We do this at point of prescription. We do this at the chemist. And um, we do this as, as, as human beings. Um, so we're just trying to bring the law into line with where medicinal cannabis um, is. So most importantly, this is for the patients. And, but I think from a secondary perspective, Victoria prides itself on taking on being a leader in progressive policy, but also in progressive medicine. Mm -hmm. And we were the first to legalise medicinal cannabis back in 2016. But we know patients are choosing to not go on to medicinal cannabis because of that prohibition on driving. You know, we've got to pick the kids up from school after we've got to get to work. We want to be able to drive to to live our lives to the fullest. Um, so people are choosing to stay on opioids or benzodiazepines or other impairing medication where they're not denied the right to drive. You raise a really interesting point there that I hadn't considered until you said it, and that is how it affects regional Victorians the most. Anecdotally speaking, I've got a dozen friends on medical cannabis who have never had a roadside drug test in their life. I've got friends in you know Bendigo, Kerrang, Mildura, areas like that, that have had multiple roadside drug tests. So there clearly is a kind of gap and a divide here. I've never had a roadside drug test in all my years in Melbourne, yet here these friends have had multiple. And the issue is like they don't have public transport. When we first introduced this bill back in 2019, I used the example of a, a man that I had met, a young man who had had epilepsy for most of his life. So had been denied the right to drive because he was not seizure free for six months. He then got onto a, you know, as a high CBD, very low THC medication, and he was seizure free for six months, which meant that he qualified <laughs> to get a license, which meant for this young man, an apprenticeship. It meant going to TAFE. It meant all of these other things. But because he couldn't drive, um, it was two hours on the bus and two hours back on the bus because he lived in regional Victoria to get to the TAFE. It was just, it was, it was impossible. And it's relatively dehumanising, isn't it? I think this is the broader thing about decriminalisation is giving people the opportunity and the space to function within the world and remove those discriminatory barriers. So there's a good connection there that this is what this roadside drug testing is. It is discrimination. It's entirely discrimination. And as we know, medicinal cannabis is the only prescribed medicine that you are prohibited from driving um, and not because you're impaired, only because there's a chance that there, you will be picked up with the presence of some THC in your system, but not as a result of being impaired, as a result of using a medication that has been prescribed to you by your doctor and you're using it to make yourself feel better. I know that there's been a suggestion that there could be some kind of impairment test. And even you spoke at the Astrid Assembly about the potential for something like a concussion test. I've also heard you say that it maybe isn't something we need to be thinking about too much. Talk to us about that a bit more. I think it's a rabbit hole that we don't need to go down because we have been managing fitness to drive amongst patients who are using impairing medication for decades. There are hundreds of thousands of Australians who are right now using a medication that may impair them. Now, that might be some Valium to help them sleep or to deal with their anxiety. That might be an opioid medication. That actually might be an antidepressant. It could even be a blood pressure medication that has the possibility of impairing some patients. And we manage that risk. We do this through the way we prescribe it, the advice on when to take it, what times of day to take it, um, the advice that 
Don't drive if you are feeling impaired. Don't use heavy machinery if you are feeling impaired. So for decades, this has been accepted that we can do this. I don't see why for medicinal cannabis, we actually have to test for impairment because we don't trust those patients to be able to manage their lives. And we don't trust their doctors to provide them with the adequate information and advice they need to ensure they drive only when it's safe to do so. I think impairment testing down at the track will be important and it will be important in reducing our road toll. But that will be impairment on the basis that you haven't slept. That will be impairment maybe because of some impairing drugs. It may be because of an impairing disability. Um, There's all sorts of reasons why people may be impaired when they drive. But right now, what we need to do is fix the law so that medicinal cannabis patients are not discriminated against and treated the same as any other patient on a potentially impairing medication. And I guess it kind of plays into that discrimination that even just exists for general cannabis use, just that belief that you're somehow doing something dodgy. And you see it in the news, even as we're reporting on this movement and these bills, they're still calling it weed and pot. Australia is the only jurisdiction that has an outright prohibition on medicinal cannabis patients from driving in every other jurisdiction. And every expert in this area from the International Road and Traffic Safety Commission, every single agency says that patients should not be denied the right to drive. It's weighing up the balance between that person's right to a healthy life and road safety. And as I've said, we do this with every other medication. It's a tr- level of trust we give to everyone else except for cannabis users, and that's why it's so important. It's not to suggest that there won't be some people that might take advantage of those rules or some people that might do the wrong thing, but that's already happening in every other regard. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, they use statistics and they come back with these statistics that, oh, we found cannabis, we found THC and this many, you know, this percentage of road fatalities or serious road accidents as if there is a causal link. I think they say that 14% there's THC in their system. Now, we know that the vast majority of people in that that cohort are actually young men. As statistics show us, around 30% of those young men are regularly using cannabis. So the fact that it's only coming up at 15% actually probably shows you something, that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about patients. We're talking about patients who are largely taking this medication for anxiety and for insomnia. And so it enables them to sleep and makes them feel better in the morning. It's interesting you mentioned the statistics because in light of South Australia's recent law change where you can now instantly lose your license, you know, in Victoria, we're looking at moving forward in South Australia, they've chosen to move backwards. And their police minister has justified it by saying that drugs are involved in 20% of road fatalities. Well, 100% of fatalities involve roads as well. So are we going to ban roads? Now, obviously I'm being facetious, but the use of statistics is almost like sub-primary school level of thinking. Yet it seems to fly in the media. It seems to fly in the public. They splash these numbers out. They stand by them. They're steadfast with them. What chance do we have, given the overwhelming blowout loss in the recent vote in New South Wales? Kate Farman presented a bill with a similar idea. Huge loss. What hope do we have in Victoria for this bill to be passed with that in mind? To be honest, and we've actually worked harder and longer on this. So we've been talking about this since 2016. In fact, the Victorian Law Reform Commission's report into medicinal cannabis did touch on this, and at no point did they say there should be a prohibition. I've had amendments to road safety legislation for the last eight years, touching on this in 2019. An expert working group was established that considered how we would enable. It wasn't if, it was how we were going to enable medicinal cannabis patients to drive safely. Now, we couldn't come to agreement in 2009. They said there wasn't enough information out there. There wasn't enough research. Well, there is now. The National Transport Commission has released in 2022, June 2022, explicit and detailed guidelines for medicinal cannabis prescribers, for doctors with patients on medicinal cannabis, about how to assess their fitness to drive, and how to manage any risk of this impairing medication. Those same guidelines recognise that, you know, the antidepressants have got an impairing, um, a possible impairment, not all antidepressants, but some, 
But because so many people take them, they would never for a minute think about prohibiting people from driving, even though they are as impairing, if not more impairing than medicinal cannabis. We've had those arguments. We've got these really explicit guidelines for doctors now. We've got, you know, the Royal College of General Practitioners providing good guidance. We've got the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, the Victorian branch, supporting changes. And we've also got the research. So Swinburne, Monash, all of them have now done the research. We know all that information. And we've got a premier who has stated publicly that this needs to change. I'm a tragic optimist. I know that. But I do feel that in Victoria, this is a time that we can go forward. It sounds like there's good reason to be cautiously optimistic then for medical cannabis patients in Victoria to hope that their members of parliament see sense. Is there something we can do as individuals, as civilians, to contact our MPs? Because I have contacted my local MP, I've contacted my former MP, and I've been really disappointed with the responses. Um, Katie Hall, my local MP, her PA constantly replies just that Victoria championed medical cannabis in 2016 and we're still listening to the experts and that's kind of the end of it. Melissa Horn, who is the Minister for Gambling, ignores me. So I've been really disheartened by the responses or lack of responses I've got. I think I could probably learn to be a little bit more tactful, to be honest. But what can the average Joe do to, to make their members listen to them? There's two points to that, Paul. And and as someone who has been a fierce letter writer to MPs for nearly 30 years, I know when they don't respond, it's really bloody disappointing. And you just think, but I, you know, I work so hard on that. Don't despair too much because actually even those letters hitting an MP's inbox, even if they don't respond, and it's very lazy of them not to, um, and as now as a former MP, I tried to respond to every email, but sometimes it is impossible. It's like sometimes you know, I was actually getting a thousand emails a day. And I'm sure some of them were absolutely cooked as well. Oh, <laughs> not even begin <laughs> to cover some of the things people were saying. Um, but yeah, so don't, don't despair. Actually seeing the numbers of letters arriving in your inbox, the number of different people from your electorate having a concern about this, telling a personal story. If you can put in your experience, your experience as the carer of a loved one, your experience for yourself, your experience with medicinal cannabis, it's helpful and they may not respond, but they hear those stories and it, it it does have an impact. So I would encourage everyone to still get in contact with them. The bill that is coming up, will be debated on the 8th of March. So there is time to really encourage our local members and our ministers. So certainly Minister Horn, she's a minister for road safety. She is the person who should have carriage of this bill. My understanding is because uh, because of the way life is, uh, the minister for police is going to have carriage of this bill. Even though it has nothing to do with the Minister for Police, it is a road safety bill. Um, But, you know, so if if any of the listeners and people are out there uh, are keen to write, a a letter to Minister Carbines would also be helpful. Given the conversation about cannabis in Australia, what legs does the general movement have? You know, federally we're seeing David Shoebridge do some work presenting a bill. Obviously we've got Rachel Payne and the Legal Cannabis Victoria Party coming in and probably holding Dan Andrews to account much like you have for the last few years. Are we looking good? You know, generally speaking, it's not about a time frame. It's not about a time limit or when we'll get recreational legalization. But do you think we're making positive steps forward as a country, as a state? I do think we are. Even, you know, you've got the the idiots like the minister down in South Australia just being so incredibly thoughtless and not recognising that the, he is talking about patients. He is talking about people who have been legally prescribed a medication. Putting those people aside, I think we have made progress. And I go back to that use of cannabis report that I chaired in the last term of government. We got over a 1,000 submissions. That is the most submissions that any inquiry has received. So there was a great deal of interest. And it was from a broad range of expert and peak organisations and every single one of them, bar the Delgano Institute and Drug Free Australia, called for law reform. The Victorian police, uh, they were a bit wishy-washy, but every non-government organisation, whether that was Legal Aid, the Law Institute, the AMA, all of the peak bodies. So we've got them over the line. 
In that report, even the government members supported further investigation into what a regulated industry might look like. I didn't get what I wanted, which was that we recommended that we let we regulate cannabis, the sale of cannabis in Victoria, um, but we got a, a small step forward. So it's inevitable that we're going to get there. What that looks like is different. Personally, I don't think the federal, the Greens proposal at a federal level is what it should look like or what it will look like. But for every one step back, we are making at least one and a half steps forward. <laughs> yes, you do the math. We're still creeping ahead. <laughs> so we're still, still in the right direction. <laughs> it is great to hear you have that optimism because let's talk about the personal inquiry into cannabis use. That was something I took a week off work to write my submission for in Canada. You and know, thank you for that. And I think that's what I want the politicians to hear. You know, People take this really seriously and they're willing to put things on the line for that. How did that come about? How does a, an inquiry into cannabis use come about, first of all? And then why did it essentially get ignored? Two excellent questions. Um, and there, there's a there's another question and there was one, why did it take so long? Um, it was an interesting exercise and probably an unusual exercise for a parliament that I actually put up a motion for that inquiry. So I put up the motion to be debated in parliament. The, the motion was agreed to. I was also the chair of the committee that was going to, um, so I was putting a motion to myself, you know, which was good. But it was also, many of your listeners will remember that, that you know, New Zealand was having a referendum on legalising cannabis. And some of us, again, were, quite, were, were quietly, were, were, were openly hopeful that we would get that across the line. And, we, and it came very close, as everyone knows. So I was hoping that that inquiry would coincide with a successful referendum in New Zealand, so we kept delaying the, 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 the we kept delaying the inquiry just to make sure just to see if we could get um, New Zealand across the line before we really got into that inquiry. Sadly, that that wasn't to be. New Zealand didn't didn't get it across the line. The fact that that inquiry was that report was ignored was incredibly scandalous. It's actually a breach of parliamentary legislation. It was actually a breach of the law. Unfortunately, under our Parliament Act, where governments are required to respond under the Act to inquiries within six months of publication, failure to respond, the Act is silent. So they must by law respond, but if they don't, nothing happens really being held to account there, obviously. Really being held to account. Um, now, I would say that's part of the unfinished business that I'll be hoping that Rachel and David from the Legalised Cannabis Party work on, that we change that so that we ensure that the hard work of people like yourself, Paul, and the hundreds of other people who took the time and the effort not only to present cogent arguments for reform but to tell their own personal stories to talk about the impact of the legis the current legislation on their lives and on the lives of their loved ones. To ignore that, it is not the way we want to see members of parliament treat our con their constituency. And while we are just quickly on that, you know, when there is a growing um, decline in trust in our politicians, there's a growing decline in trust in our governments. Now more than ever, our governments should be responsive. Now more than ever, they should be open to scrutiny. To not do that now just further diminishes the faith we have in our governments to act openly, transparently, you know, in the way that their constituency wants them to. It's interesting because I think the lack of a meaningful opposition party in Victoria is a huge detriment to our progress. I think Victoria gets a lot of credit for being progressive, something that I think you've been a huge part of. But sometimes I worry that we're only progressive compared to the other states and our lack of kind of true competition and, and any kind of gusto from the libs and from Matthew Guy has really given Dan Andrews agency to kind of do whatever he wants, which is interesting because when I read about ACT and their drug progress, they often say it's because they've been in power for so long that they've been able to do these things. Why are we not seeing similar from Dan Andrews? Why aren't we seeing him use his huge popularity and, and huge sway to actually move these causes forward. You know, even progressive governments never want to be too progressive. And the Labor Party is a factionalised party. While the Liberal Party calls themselves a broad church, you know, Labor has got people from the 1950s DLP 
that are very conservative through to the socialist left, which is obviously a bit more progressive on these issues. And having said that, in these last two terms that they've been in government, we saw voluntary assisted dying laws. We saw a supervised injecting room. We saw the decriminalisation of sex work. We saw safe access zones around abortion clinics, all pieces of legislation that people had tried for decades to achieve and hadn't been achieved, and we've achieved them in the last eight years. Having said that, my name was on all four of those. But we you know, we saw them kind of take the lead also in um, a lot of equality, LGBTI issues and a number of women's equality issues. So we have seen them take the lead in progressive areas. Cannabis is a really hard one. On one hand, you've got the arguments that we heard in our inquiry. We don't want to see another alcohol industry. We don't want to see another tobacco industry. We are aware of the risks of um, psychoactive substances. We are aware of those. You know, we don't want young children while their brains are developing to be drinking lots of alcohol or taking lots of other psychoactive substances. So it's easy to say no to this, but there it is changing. And I think the last household drug survey, for the first time, we saw more people in favour of cannabis reform than opposed to it. So the community is always ahead of parliaments, but the community is now starting to say that we need to reform these laws. You've been such a champion for medical cannabis. I'm curious, obviously, with the inquiry into personal cannabis use. Do you have a personal relationship with cannabis yourself? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and even more so right now. But I have been a cannabis user for most of my adult life on and off. I thoroughly enjoy cannabis. You know, I think in in a funny way, um, you know, when you when you run a small party like the sex party, well, you know, yes, the name gets your attention, but it is actually hard to get media attention. And in 2014, just before the election, I got a double page spread op-ed on why I smoke cannabis. And I think that helped me get elected. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, as as a man in my early twenties, and and some of my friends as well, the sex party did grab our attention, and it was something we voted for because of that. Because we saw, all right, provocative name, but then when you dug into it, there was real policy ideas there, and that's something that's often quite rare, you know, to see provocation and real policies. Often it's one or the other. So you did a really good job there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And then. Possibly stupidly, we changed our name to Reason, which <laughs> we thought would attract more votes, but in actual fact, it never did. Um. <laughs> I still remember that Australian uh, Q&A question, where, like, how are you going to help us get more sex? Not exactly the priority, but uh, it was definitely <laughs> grabbing the country's attention, that's for sure. I, I had a, you know, a Christian, um, I think it was, I think it actually might have been the Christian party, the Australian Christian party, um, one of their volunteers on a polling booth one day said if I made it compulsory, he'd vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but then I wouldn't win your wife's vote. So, it's, you know, oh, those repressed it's a Christians. nil-sum game for me. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, look, I've, as I say, so I've, I've always used cannabis um, personally. I've always supported the legalisation and regulation of cannabis, and I have done for decades. Um, and as someone who was an advocate for the adult industry for many years, I fully understood the impacts when you make laws prohibiting adults to make adult decisions. So from that perspective, I've always been in favour, but also now much for, for many other reasons. But as as a chemotherapy patient at the moment, I've got a prescription now for medicinal cannabis due to the side effects of the chemo. And even though I'm very lucky, I'm getting through it with not with the same horror stories that so many other people who are on chemo experience, but it makes me feel like shit. It makes me nauseous. It gives me insomnia. Oh, I'm on a vape and that that helps me sleep. And it certainly has also cut the edge off some of the nausea um, that I've had. So, yeah. I've enjoyed it, but I'm also seeing the the medical benefits of it right now. Well, Fiona, you're a politician that has acted with integrity. Unfortunately, that isn't something we can say about all our politicians. So I'm wondering if you might be up for playing a game with us today. It's called Aussie MPs Behaving Badly. How do you feel about that? Bring it on. <laughs> Excellent. Let's do this thing.
So this is called Aussie MPs Behaving Badly. There are seven questions, six multiple choice, one audio. Let's play. Question one. In 2015, in an attempt to show appreciation for a farmer that was showing him fresh produce, Prime Minister Tony Abbott famously and strangely took a bite out of what raw vegetable? Was it a potato, ginger, or an onion? Seriously, this was just one of the weirdest stunts. And 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 that's saying something, because Tony Abbott just did really weird things <laughs> a lot. But to take a big bite out of an onion was quite extraordinary. Um, you know, I, I, don't try this at home, I would suggest. Question two. In 2021, then member for Q, Tim Smith, was found to be drunk driving at twice the legal limit when he crashed his car into a fence. What type of vehicle was he driving? Was it a Mercedes-Benz, an Aston Martin, or a Jaguar? Look, it certainly wasn't a car that was provided by the parliamentary carpool, that's for sure. <laughs> um... <laughs> he's still claiming that uh, daily exemption, though, and he's still getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was getting his car allowance when the man was um, banned from driving. <laughs> it was, yeah, quite quite incredible. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't... I don't actually pay attention to cars. I'm interested in what colour they are. And I'm particularly interested if somebody else is driving them because I'm not, you know, I love to be driven. But I think it was a Jag. That is correct. It was indeed your two from two. You know your MP is behaving badly. <laughs> but I mean, when you think of Tim Smith, like the list is quite long on behaving badly. I know? actually didn't know what thing to pick for Tim Smith. It That's was right. too hard. <laughs> Question three, this is an audio question. So we're going to listen to a clip of outspoken MP Bob Catter here. Tell me what he's on about on this one. I mean, you know, people are entitled to their sexual proclivities. You know, I mean, let there be a thousand blossoms bloom as far as I'm concerned. You know, but I ain't spending any time on it because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. Interesting there. What's what's going on? They, you know, talk about a bloody um, conversation pivot. <laughs> to go from the marriage equality debate to crocodiles um, with this let a thousand blossoms bloom bridge. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> try and depict that visually. Like, you know, there is a man that I suspect has been in his job for too long. I'm not sure that he's ever done anything about those crocodiles, you know, those crocodile eat, human eating crocodiles up in North Queensland. But he may have also been the same politician that said he would walk backwards to Burke if there was any gays in his electorate. Oh my God. These are people that have voted in. So sad. It's so sad that, yeah, they just such narrow people have so much power. Well, you were correct there. He was talking about inexplicably marriage equality. <laughs> inexplicably, yeah. Question four. In 2018, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, who was married at the time, was discovered having an affair with a staffer who was pregnant with his baby. In response to this, a code of conduct was introduced by Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull that prevented relationships between MPs and staffers. What was this code of conduct colloquially named? Was it the sex strike, the bonk ban, or the intercourse intervention? Look, if it had been Kevin Rudd um, it's issuing this, it would have been the intercourse intervention. Um, because why use a short word when you can use so many more syllables? But, you know, frugal min Prime Minister Turnbull just stuck to the bonk ban. That is correct. And he's also the reason my internet is delayed right now. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Question five. In 2014, Tony Abbott threatened to do what to Vladimir Putin? Give him a good whip around the ear, knock his block off or shirt front him. I don't actually even know what shirt fronting is, but I know he said he was going to shirt front him. But then I went, I kind of got all homoerotic on it. I was <laughs> thinking about like Putin, who, who seems to love taking his shirt off at any moment for any photograph, you know, whether he's wrestling a bear or riding bear back across the tundra um, and and tony abbott's the same i mean he'll take his shirt off for any photo opportunity as well in fact he'll take his dax off for any photo opportunity <laughs> <laughs> well, yes he did indeed threaten to shirt front him something that never actually came to fruition all right question six 
Which of the following things did former Australian treasurer Joe Hockey not say? The poor don't have cars and don't actually drive very far. If housing in Sydney was unaffordable, then no one would be buying it. Or, a packet of cigarettes is $22, that's three visits to the doctor. <laughs> oh, the really sad thing is that he's probably said all of these. I, in fact, I know he's said all of these. And he said worse as well. Yeah, I left off that um, people that want to buy a house should just get a new job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. And he then became like our ambassador for America. And then not surprising, looking at these um, statements from him, became great friends with Donald Trump. Oh, best buds. Yeah, quality guys <laughs> you can, there. You can see how they would immediately <laughs> get along. <laughs> All right, lucky last. You are six from six. This is amazing. So question seven. In 1967, Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt went missing while swimming near Point Nepean in Victoria. In what tone-deaf way was his tragic disappearance honoured? Was it with a swimming pool that was named after him, a plaque that was buried at sea, a naval vessel that was named after him and later sunk, or all of the above? <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's all of the above, but I do know that there's a swimming pool named after him because I've well, I've actually swung at the Harold Holt pool. It's a, it's a, it's a really it's a really lovely pool, but it is bizarre, isn't it? That you would name a swimming pool after someone who drowned. Um, yeah, absolutely hilarious. Uh, but yes, the Harold Holt pool is a very nice pool. That one is. All of the above, all of those things were done to honour him in such a strange, tone-deaf way. So, look, I'm going to give it to you because it's one of the answers anyway. Seven out of seven, you know your Aussie MP is behaving badly. Thank you. Thank you all. I've quite often been accused of doing that myself. <laughs> Well, I am very aware that we are very close to the end of our time together, and there was more that I wanted to talk about with decriminalization. And if we could just kind of end with this point, what is decriminalization and how is it different to legalization? Paul, we should do a whole session on language. And I think this is going to actually be really important in future campaigns and as we move towards cannabis reform. Decriminalization just means nothing because it means everything. So you've got decriminalization in the Portuguese model, which is that we we um, don't criminalize people who use or possess drugs, but we criminalize those who sell them or supply them. Um, so it's a it's a very um, imbalanced, uh, asymmetric form of regulation, and that's what we've seen not only in Portugal but we've also seen this in the ACT that form of decriminalization. Of course, you know. I was I campaigned and we successfully decriminalised sex work in Victoria, and that has an entirely different meaning because that actually meant that we removed all of the laws that decriminalised that criminalised any form of sex work and introduced regulations and taught, taught and will now treat sex work like any other business with the same occupational health and safety and planning guidelines and and controls. So I think decriminalisation now. I don't think that that is actually our goal because why would you still be creating criminals? And we know that, you know, as much as we all love to grow our own vegetables, we don't. We need to go to a shop and buy them. And the same goes for cannabis. We can make our own beer. We can make our own wine if we want to, but we generally, the vast majority of us don't. So, and then I think legalisation in some ways scares the hawkses. People imagine this kind of laissez-faire, Philip Morris-led cannabis industry. So I actually think regulating cannabis is some of the language that I'm starting to, to use a lot more frequently than legalisation because the idea of tax and regulate, because this isn't about laissez-faire. We've got laissez-faire right now. Anyone can buy cannabis. You know, kids will tell you it's easier to buy cannabis than it is to buy tobacco. So I think this is a really good conversation. It's something that we as a community need to be having. But in my mind, I find that regulation and taxation is something that's a lot more solid and it's something that people can kind of see. And, you know, you're talking about controlling the market. You're not talking about creating a market. 
And there's still this idea to an extent that within decriminalization, that people still have a problem that needs to be addressed. And I think that's what legalization opens up, that you're an adult making a decision and that you don't have a health condition. Absolutely. And I think also I think there's some of that language when we talk about recreational use. I try and avoid that term because we don't talk about the recreational use of beer. So I talk about adult use. And I think it's really important that we talk about that this is about adults and, you know, and it's like I'm involved in the vaping, some of the nicotine vaping debates as well. And, you know, it's what about think about the children, think about the children. And, you know, we'll get that we get this in the cannabis reform. Well, the children will get it. It's like the children are already getting it. If we regulate it, then we could actually protect some of those children from not getting it. And that's one of the tangible things Canada has seen, a reduction in in teen and child use because it's now in a real store rather than black market. Absolutely. And even when you look at Portugal, the age where a person uses a substance has increased. So it's gone from, I think, 14 to now to about 16 or 17. And we know from all of the data, if someone is going to have a problem with their drug use, Almost everyone who ends up with a problem with their drug use, whether it's alcohol or or illicit substances um, or cannabis, they started early. So the later someone starts, the less likely they are to have a problem with their drug use. Well, I think, as you said, this is a much broader conversation, and I think it's important that we perhaps get together down the line and talk further about this and hopefully celebrate where Victoria is at with its movement, with decriminalization, removing the discrimination for medical users. Fiona, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. My very last segment is called Paul's of Wisdom. This is where you offer a snappy dinner party fact, something you want the average person to know about cannabis or drugs or decriminalization in general. Fiona, what is your Paul of Wisdom? Okay, there's there's two things. One, um, more young people use cannabis than tobacco and it's about double. So twice as many young people um, use cannabis compared to using tobacco. So I think that is an interesting fact for people to understand. The other fact I'd like people to understand is that back in the 70s when we thought, well, okay, you and I were not thinking much in the 70s. Um, we, well, you weren't born. Um, and I, I was um, still, you know, playing with toys. But in the 70s, former Prime Minister John Gorton became the patron of normal which was the um, the campaign to change marijuana laws. In the 70s, we had a prime minister as the patron. The people I speak to from that time just assumed it was inevitable that we would legalise cannabis. And obviously, Prime Minister Gorton thought that as well. Wow. I actually had no idea about that as well. That's really there impressive. You <laughs> You've taught me that and a lot today, and it's been such a privilege and a pleasure to have you on. You're such an incredibly passionate, knowledgeable person, and you've done so much to help this state. So, Fiona, thank you for your time and thank you for all your tireless work. Thanks, Paul. Give and Tote Cannabis Conversations is written and produced by me, Paul. Music written and produced by Big Mike. Follow us on Instagram at Give and Toke or get in touch by emailing giveandtoke at gmail.com. You'll also find us on both Twitter and Facebook. All opinions expressed by program guests are solely their current opinions and do not necessarily reflect the position of Give and Toke. Content discussed in this show does not constitute medical advice. Cannabis is not legal everywhere, so please be aware of local laws. 